This is FRM Part 2, Book 3, Operational Risk and Resiliency, and the chapter on Information Risk and Data Quality Management. One important note, this chapter is taken from a textbook written by two professors uh, on Six Sigma, which of course is a model to improve operational efficiency. Uh, in particular, uh, it, it has one of its general goals to minimize defects. Um, I have a quick personal story to tell you. When I was, uh, when I was in college, in the summertime, I worked at a, a local bakery and uh, it was my job for some time to make make donuts and, and of course at the end of the line if the if the chocolate donuts didn't have the perfect amount of chocolate on them or the right amount of jelly in them or they weren't perfectly circular you know we we put them over in the irregular box and then the owner would sell those irregular donuts at a you know at some kind of a steep discount of course i ate a lot of those irregular donuts now, that analogy is probably okay for this chapter, but how about if we're a financial institution and we're looking at the same thing, you know, trying to minimize defects. And let's suppose we're in the, you know, commercial lending business unit. And, you know, let's suppose we have a, a hundred loans to local businesses, including, including the baker that I worked for. So you think about the operational challenges from when the borrower comes in uh, into the financial institution all the way up until the end of the last uh, payment to repay the loan plus all, all of that interest, you know, what can go wrong from an operational risk standpoint? So that's why this chapter is called information risk. So we collect lots and lots of information from each of these borrowers and then we manage the data. So that's why the data quality management is part of this chapter name. Now, those of you who looked at the chapter will note that it is relatively short, and so I hesitate to promise that this might be the shortest recorded video that I make uh, either in part one or part two, but it'll be super short. Of course, you could have guessed that if you looked at the learning objectives. Boy, only three. Have we ever had only three learning objectives in one of these chapters? Surely this is uh, among the lowest, if not the lowest. All right, so I'm not gonna pick from among these three as to which one or ones are more important. Let's just assume that each one of these has equal importance. So we're gonna identify common issues, right? We're going to explain how a firm can set expectations for data quality. And then we'll go ahead and talk about operational data governance process in, in the last couple of slides. Um, you know, we've talked about corporate governance, we've talked about risk governance, so it makes perfect sense to extend that to data, data governance as well. And so uh, clearly some of the principles that we've discussed in the past will apply to this chapter as well. Let's begin with a discussion on the most common issues that result in data errors. So let's go back to data errors. Let's go back to my, uh, my commercial lending business unit. So what did I say? We have a hundred of these clients out there and we've lent them between, you know, 50,000 and, you know, maybe up to a million dollars or so. These are local, generally smaller businesses. So, so what are some data errors? Of course, we can have missing data. We can have data capturing errors. You know, look at the example there, typo. When I was a graduate student, I worked for a professor who was doing this big research project, and it was my job to enter some financial information into an Excel spreadsheet. And I don't know if I had to enter a million uh, in, data into a million cells, but I promise you I didn't get them all correct. So typos is still a big issue, um, yeah, even in this day of computerization. Uh, duplicate records, I mean, that can be a problem. This is um, clearly a problem in the health care industry where you have a patient who has multiple doctors and then they have duplicate records and then it takes up space and it may skew the results. Uh, inconsistent data on the on the client you know it might be that we have a client who originally gave us some um, income data based on you know let's say a personal income tax form versus uh, the sole proprietor business income and maybe those two income levels are not the same so we need to make certain that we not only capture the data 
data accurately, but then we make sure that it's consistent. Yeah, poorly defined data, you know, this can be a big problem when you ask a client a series of questions and the client is not quite sure, you know, what you're asking or what the questions mean or what kind of an answer. And so they write down maybe or, or something like that. Uh, transformation errors, of course, going from a one to an A, from one spreadsheet to another. Uh, undocumented, incorrect, or misleading metadata. You know, so we have this, we have this data, metadata that is really a summary of all this other data. And so when we collect it and then we summarize it, we could make errors. And then how about a failed identity management process? Now I thought in reading the reading the chapter that um, these six impacts were probably fairly important here. So here's the here's inside of one of those learning objectives. What impact do data errors have? All right. So obviously financial impacts, which means something to do with the financial statements. Um, risk impacts, of course. This goes back to our discussion on risk culture and risk appetite framework, if we are somehow misidentifying or mislabeling or making any other of those range of data errors on that previous slide, then we open up ourselves to all sorts of problems on, on that risk side. Notice I have a couple of them listed there, credit assessment, competitive, competitiveness, fraud, and leakage. Uh, how about confidence-based impacts? Of course, if we're consistently reporting and correcting data errors and making forecasts based on uh, incorrect and inaccurate data, then boy, how can we have any confidence in our forecasts or our estimates? And then that can leak over into the supply chain. So notice what I have in that fourth one there, you know, customers, employees, suppliers, and the general market. So you have the supply chain on both sides can lead to satisfaction impacts, which then, of course, remember that not only is it us inside of the financial institution and our customers and clients outside of the financial institution that's interested in our business practices but there's always somebody else out there and that somebody else is always the government you know whether it's an official government body or some kind of an advisory governing body or a suggested rules government uh, govern government body so we need to worry about government regulations etc cetera, etc cetera. And then finally, and this one here links, of course, back up to the financial impacts uh, at the top of the page, increased workloads, increased processing time, compromised end of product quality. So if we have these, boy, what did I call that with that six sigma, you know, we're trying to minimize defects. So that's going to that's going to cause productivity to decline, which, of course, then, you know, shows somewhere uh, up on the perhaps the balance sheet, maybe not immediately, but on the income statement, which will eventually then show up on the balance sheet. All right, look at, uh, look at that top block point. So a high risk, high impact institution. Banks are not just sensitive to financial impacts. So we have these other kinds of impacts if we have compromised data. We need to go ahead and focus on, here, let me go back here just quickly, you know, these compliance impacts and look at this just a little bit more carefully. So Bank Secrecy Act, a group of laws designed to assist, monitor, prevent, and prosecute money laundering. You know, I'm guessing that you guys, you know, read novels or watch television shows or watch movies where there's some money laundering. And whenever there's money laundering, there has to be somebody inside the financial institution that's, that's helping, uh, launder the money. Uh, Patriot Act, of course, this is uh, this act was passed after the September 11th attacks. And so this was specifically designed to intercept and to obstruct terrorism, which means that as you know, where are we? We're inside of this risk umbrella or the risk culture where our operational risk in terms of collecting data must include a verification that the cash flows that come through our bank are the result of legitimate business practices, where, whether they're violations of the Bank Secrecy Act or the USA Patriot Act. 
Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, I always think of this act, which was passed back in 2002 as a direct result of the Enron scandal, which was you know, maybe one of the first ones. Clearly, there were multiple scandals that occurred um, before and, and after Enron. But in my mind, I kind of think of that one as, the, uh, as kind of the, uh, the instigator behind all of this. You know, what does that second circle point suggest? requires principal executive officer, principal financial officer to certify the accuracy and the correctness of financial reports, which of, co of course flips back to that top circle point, helps protect investors from fraudulent financial reporting. And I'm guessing you guys know the story of Enron where they told us they had a bunch of stuff on their balance sheet when, when they really didn't have those kinds of assets. And then the Basel II Accord, you know, we've had a whole bunch of these Basel meetings and typically they occur after a financial crisis. And this one was, was no exception. And so these are a series of recommendations um, that will help quantify both credit risk and the operational risk in terms of things like, uh, you know, economic capital and regulatory capital. And so you have something on the bottom right hand side of the balance sheet that protects against these types of risks. Now, what kind of expectations for data quality um, can a financial institution reasonably have? Um, you know, so what your chapter does is it goes through a series of key dimensions of data quality. And so these make perfect sense, right? Accuracy, completeness, consistency, reasonableness, uniqueness, and freshness, although the textbook calls it currency. Now, how about operational data governance? And so this is going to just piggyback right on top of what we talked about in, in general corporate governance and then risk governance. So look at that first definitional block point. It refers to the processes and protocols put in place to ensure acceptable level of confidence in the data. So what, what could you say? You could make some kind of a conclusion that, hey, you know what, I want I want 90% of our data to be, what did I say from that previous page? I want it to be accurate and complete and consistent, et cetera, et cetera, right? Well, 90%, you know, I made that number up. Of course, that doesn't sound anywhere near what we might want to have. Those of you who know about the Six Sigma, what is that percentage? 99.99966% of the end product during an operating uh, process uh, is defect free. So how do we do that? You know, so this data governance program then has to identify all the roles and responsibilities and then charge each individual or groups of individuals with managing the data. And then there has to be a series of responsible actions once some kind of defect occurs. All right, so what does this governance look like? So we need a, a data governance team. That makes perfect sense. So we need data stewards. I, I use that term pretty regularly about our responsibility as boards of directors and the senior leadership team all the way down to lower managers that we're steward. Essentially, we are stewards of the bondholders and the shareholders capital. They provide us with the cash flow that we need so that we can make all of these loans, right? We need a data quality analyst or a data quality analyst team. We need a council on governance and then we need a chief data officer. So, you know, I want you to, I want you to think about, so you got each individual business line commercial lending, retail banking, asset management, and so on and so forth. And so inside of each of those, you need at least part of this operational data governance system, um, if not one that blankets the entire firm. And so it probably depends on how big the financial institution is that will determine how granular this operational data governance system has to be. Now, I love talking about thresholds and benchmarks. Um, it's always good to have some kind of relative measure of performance. 
And so we can have some predefined business rules over the quality of data. And here's some examples. So here are those six pieces that we talked about a few slides ago. And so we probably have uh, different levels of acceptance and we might color code them like I did on this slide, uh, which will give us some idea of our success. And so let's start with the reasonableness. So that's 94%. So maybe we have a green level that is, you know, 92% or above. Uh, so completeness is below 90%. So that's a lesser color of green. And then look at the two accuracy and currency. Those are those are 70%. So clearly those are red. And then uniqueness and consistency, 85 and 90%. You know, so maybe we have higher standards for consistency versus completeness. So that's a, what is that, yellow or orange or whatever color that is. So my, the point of this example is that we've tried to put together the slides so that you have these benchmarks inside each one and you have a business rule each uh, for each one of these particular data qualities so that you know if you are succeeding or failing or needing to improve. How about some more details on a scorecard or some kind of a benchmark? So look, you need a base level metric. So measured against clear data quality criteria, like is it accurate? Is it easy to quantify? Is it easy to transform? Um, and then let's go ahead and put together a more complex metric where we just take a weighted average and we're used to taking weighted averages from you know portfolio management into asset management all all up to you know through some derivative securities discussions so you can do this complex complex metric you know in a couple of different ways you can do it by an issue you can do it by business process or you can do it by business impact so think of all these different business lines sometimes it's appropriate to go ahead and do this inside of a business line and maybe inside one of the functions inside of the business line uh, but sometimes you can combine those remember we're trying to be operationally efficient we, we're not trying to be operationally perfect. And I think that takes us through. So uh, there are the three learning objectives, and I would know each of those.